what are sort of some of the fundamental um, neuromuscular, I guess, uh, adaptations that both a, a coach would you would like to understand, developing coach to understand in their practice for for reconditioning, but but also for an athlete um, to understand um, that might be thinking at that stage of um, do I just need to return to my baseline strength and maybe jeep running outputs and then I'm I'm back to normal, but there's much more to it in terms of the how. Yeah, I'll try I'll try and list off a, f- a few things and make this cohesive. Um, the first thing that I think is a crucial message is, uh, and I quote my, my friend Sophia Nymphius on this one, is just because you have the strength doesn't mean you use it. But if you don't have the strength, you can't use it. And why this is so important is that our world of uh, performance training gravitates towards, or sort of let's say, towards a, a functional training. And I'm using, I'm using that in scare quotes for people who can't see me. And, and I just got some bubbles around my head. I don't know if anyone else saw that. Yeah, I love, uh, I love the AI movement recognition there that goes on with the with these uh, wow. web platforms. Anyway, that would be cool. Never seen that before. Yeah, for for anyone who's just like doesn't see the video, I just d- gave scare quotes, and I ended up with like a whole bunch of colored balloons around my head uh, yeah, on video. So, that. anyways, whatever. But yeah. the reason I bring this up is that like you have a paradigm in in our world where you know. You, you know, you gravitate towards one, which just says, you know, hey, it's all about being functional. You know, put yourself on a Swiss ball or a BOSU ball and balance and close your eyes and you've got it all covered. And then mm-hmm. on the other hand, you have people who have you doing Nordics and hamstring curls and whatever, whatever, whatever. And those two camps polarize and they polarize because the one says the other side is doesn't make any sense. And I guess my first message would be that you have to think about the body as a system and you can't just throw any one side out of these things. Take us through how you sort of, I guess, from plus one from game day, what are your big rocks from a central peripheral point of view, both for recovery and then priming them for the upcoming game? Um, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a, it, yeah, good question. I mean, the, the first thing that I, that I often think about um, and I, you know, Dan, Dan Path was always a really good, uh, uh, good at framing this up for coaches, but he called it uh, creating mailboxes for the athlete. And so mailboxing means that you would come up with sort of a heuristic, which would allow you to take an athlete postcard profile and put it into the right mailbox. And um, I, I started, I started uh, very early on thinking about athletes in that way because it helped me simplify a team where you might have 20 players and you're trying to figure out who's who in the in the zoo right and in in this uh in this vein there's a really nice paper that uh, was written where they describe um athletes according to four phenotypes they describe them as a thoroughbred who has both a decent level of speed and work capacity uh, a workhorse an athlete who really responds well to lots of work and for whom intensity will sometimes be a real depressant on their physical abilities You've got the bolter, and the bolter is your classic high-speed, twitchy athlete who lacks capacity. But I guess when we're working with the optimal, with the with the best athletes and um, and resources at your at your fingertips, what's happening with the the latest research when it comes to um, having an objective measure, in managing athletes' loads and and how they're moving as well? Um, uh, yeah, t- talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess. Um uh one of the technologies i'm most keen on these days um i uh, will just kind of maybe uh, qualify by saying that um i'm not actually currently researching this technology this is technology that i'm actually using as a consultant or a practitioner um, but i've been very uh encouraged by um uh the use of imu based technology uh, especially that's been that's shoeborne, so inside the shoe. Um, I, uh, there's a company called Plantiga. Uh, it's a Canadian company out of Vancouver, but essentially they've got a, a, an IMU that can go inside any piece of footwear. So don't think about it as an insole. It could go into your orthotic. It could go into your stock orthotic in your shoe. You could embed it into your shoe or your skate. It can go in a cleat. Um, it's just a little wafer that uh, it basically has, uh, you know, uh, uh, an IMU uh, in- embedded in it. I guess from a practical point of view for coaches listening in, um, more specifically for rehab practitioners, um, where there is an asymmetry, whether it be the knee extensor strength, you mentioned the 30%, or, or some stiffness qualities, um, like we're talking about where, where you're trying to um, improve the contact time with, with running, let's say, for example, um, how, you, how you're sort of 
uh, approaching that from a programming point of view? Are you starting with perhaps every set? I don't know if there's a left side that there's a gap. Are you doing your left side first and just continuing this that same load on the right on the right side? Uh, are you doing more volume or, or or just certain unilateral plyos only on that left side? Like talk us through your uh, approach to um, picking up that asymmetrical side. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I you know I, I use a constraints based approach for this one. So anytime I see something that's globally in a movement that's reflecting a side to side difference that's meaningful, and it's now become consistent pattern, and now it's above the norm, and now it's consistently above the norm for this individual. Um, the first question I have is what internal physiological constraints could be driving this range of motion, joint by joint strength, as an example. So um you know normally this is where it's great to team up with your athletic therapy department or your physical therapist and just start to kind of like really go through and assess what's limiting this person uh according to their range of motion and their strength that's available at each joint the second piece is if they check the boxes and the ranges are clean across all joints the strength is clean across all joints and and that's check 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 the next question is is how do they take that strength and put it into play so that goes back to just because you have it doesn't mean you use it. But if you don't have it, you can't use it. The phenotype, what's some of your favorite strategies to identify types within a squad? Um, uh, and we, bi weekly, a... yeah, yeah. Bi weekly counter movement jumping with a, with, a, with, a, with a force plate and capturing load. And I look at, I usually ask two additional questions with my load monitoring. I always ask an energy level question. So what was your energy in the workout? And uh, 10 is the best you've ever felt. Zero is absolutely atrocious. And I try to look for index workouts on a Wednesday, let's say, where it would be, let's say, an unload day and I'm expecting energy levels to be high and, en and uh, uh, energy levels are high, but uh, perceived exertion is low. And so if I can stitch together your energy level, your RPE and your mechanical muscle function with the jump testing, now I've got three things that let me see how you react to load. And so if I've got those three things, I can apply different strategies to see which load response is the one that seems to elicit a better response for you. 